Hi everyone, Oskar Świerat here. Welcome to a new TechArt 8 episode. This time I'd like to talk about what it takes and how it is to work as a technical artist. Typically I focus on showing various techniques and how to use them, for example in Unreal, but this time I'd like to have a discussion about how it is to work as a technical artist, who do we usually work with and, and how it looks like. I thought it may be also interesting to some of you to get some advice on how to look for the specific kind of a job and how to prepare for it, not only in terms of portfolio, but also uh, what kind of skills to learn. As for the more experienced of you, I'd like to know how you started and what you think is important in this kind of a role, so please have a nice discussion in the comments later, and let's go! So this thing here is a map. It's a simplified map showing various disciplines tech art usually works with. At the same time, I think these are the backgrounds that technical artists come from most often. As for my case, if this can be an example, I was already doing 3D art, 2D art while still in high school. And at that point, even though I spent a lot of time on the internet, I didn't know there are positions like a technical artist, even an environment artist. So I was quite afraid to apply for a 3D artist job because I considered it a bad thing that I don't know how to model characters, that I'm not in interested in this kind of stuff. I thought this was limiting. But fortunately they, they, were, they explained to me that hey, this is an environment art position, don't worry about that. You will be doing tracks for a racing game for a Nintendo DS. So I thought, okay, fine, I, I think I can do it. And as I was working there in Cubic Games, the company grew from four people, only four people, to 15 when I was leaving them like four years later. Throughout this time, I was working on environments, but I also did level design because I found it to be interesting. And somehow in the process, I was also doing scripts for Blender because I always find pro found programming quite interesting, but of course my best skills when in 3D that in that moment. So I just did it as a supplementary work just to get things done faster, quicker. Then I, I programmed some scripts. Later I did them for the entire team. And after I was quite confident in it, I went to one of my leads and asked, okay, listen, I have an idea for, for a procedural generation of our part of our levels. And he said, you know, I think it's a bad idea because you're an artist. So the code would probably be quite rubbish in some places. Just stick, stick to what you are doing. It's of course very cool, but you know, I, I can trust you that the code will be stable and, and uh, useful in production. Fortunately, I continued to work on that, let's say in the meantime. And sometime after that, another lead came to me and said, I, I see your point. I, I see what you, what, what you are trying to do. So what about if I give you a month and let's try what happens? And I was like, okay, great. I'm ready for that. Let's do it. And I teamed up with two different people and designed the stuff. This proved to be useful. Of course, the, the first version was like ugly, hacked, but we continued after that to improve it. And that way, while work, working on environments, I started to work on the one of the biggest tool we had in the company later to gen, procedurally generate big parts of the levels based on a level designer's input. So I didn't seek specifically a technical art position at the moment, especially that the company was, was quite small, as I said. There was a lot of work to do. Everyone uh, was supposed to help when, wherever they could, but it didn't prevent me to learn and create this, this, these scripts at the same time. Especially I think that when you are motivated to do something, you, you are definitely able to find some time or learn after hours or, or whatever. This was like 2012. And since that, I've worked on VR projects in Unity when I had to pick up Unity on the fly because I was working with Unreal at home and custom engines in Cubic Games. And later I was also for a moment a Houdini artist uh, at another company which was doing 
kind of a VFX kind of kind of work. And I think all this all this stuff accumulates somehow. And since last September 2017, I'm lucky to work at CD Projekt Red as a technical artist. So this is my first actual strict role as a technical artist. Of course, this doesn't mean that I have less work to do, or if it is more boring. Why, on the contrary, there is a lot of stuff that I can finally do, because I can devote my full time to making tools, making shaders, and some proper research and development in, instead of just hacking stuff quickly on the fly. As for the members of my team, TechArt, their backgrounds are quite varied and interesting, because they range from people who were doing some cool plugin for Maya and for Blender on the forums, and they got discovered and asked, would you like to work here? Which is a proof that whatever you are doing, if it's cool, show it, don't be afraid. Even if you're doing it just for learning, don't, don't be afraid to show stuff. Got some critique, got some response, maybe somehow from the actual company can see it and give you feedback or ask for a job as in, the, in this example. I also have people who were active in modding scene of The Witcher, but of course my lead is the most uh, experienced person here working since The Witcher 1. This was much smaller game than, than the current things, so they didn't have a tech art department yet. He was the one to build it, build it over the years. So as you can see, the backgrounds of people working on tech art can be very different. And don't worry if you are more into programming or blueprints. Especially, I think, on personal projects, you can acquire a ton of useful experience. Because often this is the small stuff that matters. Like, not being the most skillful person on the planet when you want to do tech art, but rather knowing all the intricacies of the engine. Like, being there. That you already tested the path. For example, you used the destructible mesh feature in Unreal. So you already know that this can lead to problems, that the tool has many bugs that are now backlogged. And this kind of experience will be very useful when somebody asks you to come up with some real-time destruction solution in Unreal. Because you are not al already know what can emerge from that. So this also means that you don't have to worry that you already spent some years in game development and you are not a technical artist yet if it'd be har hard to switch into this position or not. I feel that any time is, is a good opportunity to, to switch, uh, if this is the thing you want to do. In this talk, I'd like to show you the, the reality of working as a technical artist, so maybe it would make it also easier for you to decide if this is the role you'd like to pursue it or not. Let's take a look at the map, and we may begin with shaders. So obviously, Nowadays, a lot of artists can create their own materials or shaders thanks to the node-based system in Unreal and now a similar system is coming to Unity this year. But shader development is something more because you have to be aware of the technical limitations of all this, of the performance cost, for example, or how many texture samplers you may use in a single shader. And where most complex shaders are required, is when you have non-standard materials, for example, uh, uh, an ice surface with uh, perceived thickness, or other non-standard materials like lava, like uh, skin, and animated materials. Because, of course, now a lot of animation can be done in shaders directly, and this is a great case for things like neon signs, holograms, various effects. And there are also difficult cases. One of the cases is, for example, frosted glass. This requires either some modifications in the engine or support from the engine side, or just very careful consideration of the limitations and the effect we want to achieve, because you will have to cut corners on current generation of hardware. And there is also post-processing. This is especially the area where you don't only have to develop the solution, though this may be the case, for example, in chromatic aberration, this is quite easy, but most often your artistic eye is also required on that. You can't just program the effect, it has to look plausible and it has to look like the art director sees it. Now, moving to effects, you will be working with VFX artists here. 
And VFX artists are usually technically skilled. They have a lot of knowledge in here, but in many cases, this can be related to the systems they are using. Like for example, they are doing a simulation in Houdini or in fume effects. They are focusing on that part, but there's also the part when some tricks may be required to run this later in the engine because their, the results of their work are often baked to textures or saved in some other clever ways. Let's assume that the VFX artist created three variants of a destroyed surface, damaged surface, and then you are creating the material that blends between them based on some factors and on some masks. So this is another special case of shader work. When you are using the inputs from simulations, and applying it to, to the real-time engine. There is also a case like rivers, because a river simulation consists of millions of particles, but it can be baked down, at least in, uh, in, in some extent, to textures, to flow maps. And then you may be the person that can create a shader that uses flow maps and applies textures from texture artists to mix foam with water, with deep water, that applies foam around, uh, for example, some stones that are lying in, in the middle of the river. And there is also procedural environment animation, because some animation can be faked just by skipping the simulation completely and doing it, for example, in a shader like clothes uh, slightly moving because of the wind of the turbulence. Now we have workflows and R&D research and development. This is a very interesting case, because often, as a technical artist, you may be very useful at the beginning of the project. Of course, it depends on the team, how do they want to work, but sometimes a smaller team is first uh, testing the new grounds. You may be a great help in testing new software, especially the one that is better quality, or if you are not sure whether it will be useful in this current game. Also, helping to define art style by testing what's possible. For example, what kind of new shaders or new lighting solutions we may come up with, or how to export meshes in some clever way, to be able to use uh, or to achieve a certain art style. Now here, it may be a great opportunity to create sample assets, because it's much easier to explain something on a ready asset that somebody can just open later and probably in a new tool develop in-house and see, okay, I see your point, this is how it's, how it's to be done. These are the names of the layers that should be present to export it, and so on. And this is directly related to, to your work on workflows, because you, as a person who has artistic experience, may be the great candidate to, to decide uh, how do the workflow should, should look like? For example, that some parts of the new process that engineers are, are coming up with are too complicated, or maybe that they can be some, some ready-made tools can be used to speed that up. For example, to generate normals for cell shading. And often beginning of a new game, especially a sequel, can be a great opportunity to speed up old workflows, to analyze what went wrong, what went well, and just come up with the new solution that, okay, we may improve here, we may create a tool for this particular part of the pipeline or the workflow. The next area is optimization and debugging. And the next area is optimization and debugging. This is also the area where you will be working a lot with quality assurance, QA, because testers will send some bugs and you will be the person to analyze them, probably. You understand what artists could have done wrong, or at the same time you understand what problem in the engine it may be. Or maybe some general problem, like, ah, this is caused by Z fighting, or this is caused by improper normals or improper use of lighting. Maybe too many lights were in the, in the same place, and one of them just vanished because uh, there are four lights per pixel. And this is the kind of knowledge that you may be familiar with, because you worked on art stuff and or on technical stuff at the same time. At least you tried to understand that. Also, the more cases like that you solve and 
talk to artists, talk to programmers about that, then the more knowledge like that you will have. So the better candidate you will be to debug further, further things like that. When you are done with, with finding them, you will be tasked or it would be great if you just did it by, by yourself to communicate it to artists. Write some documentation to compile the knowledge and, and r maybe write an article that says about best practices, about the most frequent bugs and how to avoid them. And when it comes to optimization, you will be either expected to propose new solutions for artists, like what they, what can they do better to, to fit in the budget, but also to use profilers. There is a, a video I did about an Intel profiler, is the last one in the profiling series, so you can take a look at it. This is a kind of general debugging software for graphics. So it not only measures performance, it also allows you, for example, to grab a frame from the running game and look what textures were loaded, which meshes were loaded. Very useful stuff. Now, education. This is kind of related to, to what I talked about a, a moment before, because you will be often in contact with engineers and then expected to pass the knowledge to artists. And even if this is not expected for you, it's, it's a great thing to do. I want to make a point that you worked with art tools, so you can explain it in the terms that are related to these art tools or these workflows. And there is also a big task that nobody wants to touch mostly, it is writing documentation. I mean, using the engine, looking how the things work like, and then writing it down in an understandable, nice way. And this is quite a tricky thing because you can't do that just once. The tools are in development for most of the game and the documentation has to be updated accordingly. So this is also where you will be connecting artists with programmers. Because I don't know why this is the case, and you may treat it more like an anecdotal evidence, I may be exaggerating, but often I felt like a negotiator between two warring tribes, artists and programmers. If this is the case in your team, then it's a very important thing to close the gap as much as you can. The gap of not understanding each other. Because artists are often surprised why the programmers expect everything to be in a strange format, very strict, or using some strange in-house tools, why they can be normal tools, like we already know them. And this leads us to pipeline. There are workflows and there are pipelines. The difference between them is that workflows are the ways of doing something, the procedures. Like for example, a mesh begins with a rough blockout version, then it is accepted by lead or not, tested quickly in game, polished, then tested again, then textured, and exported to the engine. This is a workflow for characters, for example. But pipeline, in this case, is the whole set of tools that are required to push the mesh to the final game. So the pipeline may begin with exporter, then there is a version control system, then there is some automated script on the server, and later are the importing tools in the engine. So this is the pipeline for assets. So when working on pipeline, you may be tasked with, with doing a lot of batch tools that y you have to analyze the, the current pipeline and what's the slowest part in it, especially when it comes to iteration times. Because for the final mesh, the pipeline can, can be long. This is the distinction that is often overlooked, that for the final mesh, we can have a long pipeline, but before the mesh is accepted and tested and changes are possible, then the pipeline should be as short as possible or as automated as possible. So I mean short from the perspective of the artist. That you may, for example, create a tool that takes this blockout mesh without any data and skips the part that you have created this data for the engine, like UVs, like proper normals or proper names, just make a tool that allows to view this thing in engine quickly. 
or it may be some validation thing that, for example, it looks uh, throughout the entire level and finds the meshes that are located underground and never to be seen or never seen from the perspective of, of the player's area. This may be a nice badge too. Also collision setup, because something may be required by the engine, like collisions, otherwise then the things will clip through the ground, but making them the proper collisions can be time consuming. So you may create an asset in Houdini that takes a mesh, creates a collision automatically from voxels, and exports it together with the mesh even straight to the to the repository and later to the engine. Validation is also a great thing here, because artists may lose a lot of time but by having to check everything manually, if this is correct, if the polygon is count is okay, if we didn't excel, ex, if we didn't exceed texture count on the mesh, and most of the of the job can be actually done with tools, with automated tools. Only later that they can warn the artist and say, look at this mesh, something's wrong. Correct it or check it later. And then there are tools. So from what I've seen in the job openings from various companies, this seems to be the most important thing that technical artists are required to do. These are the tools that are not as big as custom engines or some custom standalone applications, but often these are the scripts that can't be found on the internet. Like you can't buy them on or download them because your specific game may require some tool. As a tool creating technical artist, you will be supposed to make artists life easier. That's the main point here, that everything can be made manually, of course, but it requires a ton of time. And as I said, in cases of iteration, it can be a, a very huge saving when somebody is here to create a tool that works fine for artists and at the same time does the job required by the engine. While I was working in Cubic Games, they had a franchise that was called Air Race and we were about to create a, a new part in the series called Air Race Speed, which would be some kind of a time trial racer a tunnel racer. So the player moved at a very high speed through curved tunnels and avoided obstacles. That was the idea. This was meant for Nintendo 3DS. So the opportunities for, for optimizations were quite high, the requirements very strict. And our workflow at the beginning, we thought it was clever because we were doing modules in a aligned, uh, in a straight axis. Uh, like a very long tunnel in a straight axis, then putting curves in Blender and deforming these modules along these curves. So it was quite nice, but soon we discovered that we need longer tracks. And there was a, a limitation of our engine, which of course was also an issue of the technical possibilities of the 3DS, that we have to split these tracks into smaller pieces, we call it regions. And these regions had to be connected by portals. Portals were like planes attached to regions at the uh, start and at the end. If the player was seeing a portal connected to the region, then the, the region was displayed, otherwise it was hidden. This was a sort of a very basic occlusion calling from the PlayStation 2 days or something like that. Very simplified, but not so much performance hungry. And there was this problem, because we had to manually split the track into regions, rename the pieces, attach the portals and do it every time the curve changed. For example, if level designer said that this needs to be longer and edited the curve, then it used more modules, we had to split into more regions. So what seemed very easy and, and straightforward at the beginning was a hell in production at the end. Like, we spent 90% of our time as free 3D artists, we, we are working on that, a team of three. So we needed something better. And this was one of the reasons I, I pushed for the tool I mentioned before. That we needed some automated solution that at least cuts these things and, and names them, and they are ready for export. Later, 
there was a lot more features in that. And the tool grew and grew in, in more things that we thought that are very easily automated. If they can be codified into some procedure, let's automate it. We don't have to do that later. Or maybe we have to do some slight manual tweaks instead. This custom tool that we made used a lot of features that are already present in Blender, just utilize the built-in tools. Sometimes more like a macro than a, than a separate software. So we didn't have to write math from the beginning, we just used the, the tools that the software offers. The only thing it took was to learn Python and to learn Blender's API, but at least we didn't have to learn so much more, that would be too much for me at the moment. So this was one kind of a, of a tool that I developed in, in my career. And the last discipline is animation. Animation technical artists are often called character TDs, which are character technical directors, or just character technical artists. And usually they, they are like a, a separate discipline. When you are aiming to be a character TD, you don't have to worry about all the rest of the stuff, like shaders, effects, pipeline, and, and, uh, and debugging. Just focus on creating rigs, scripted rigs, that control the way the bones rotate, that have some limitations, that have some automated stuff in them. And also, you may be interested in, in, in doing procedural animation. For example, it may make more sense to use procedural animation of fish or a flock of birds than to animate it all by hand. Or just support the main animation with, with such solutions uh, exposed to, to animation controls. Also, clove simulation is a, is a big topic in, now in games. Because to make a good clove simulation, you have to know the technical intricacies, you have to know how to prepare the mesh properly, and this comes with experience. like. The settings of the simulation require a, a lot of experience with the system you are using. Now, let me show you some examples of job openings I found throughout the internet. The first one comes from Starbreeze Studios. This is the studio behind my favorite Chronicles of Riddick and later Payday 2. Quote, As a technical artist, you will, with a unique combination of artistic and technical expertise, be the bridge between our artists and engineers. You proactively solve problems and demonstrate creativity and a respect for aesthetics. As a technical artist, you will enjoy technical as well as artistic ownership of assets, pushing your aesthetic and technical skills to the fullest. To be successful in this position, you have excellent experience in Maya, Experience in using and managing pipeline for proprietary or public game engine. Extremely competent Python programmer for both Maya and standalone tools. Experience with material authoring and industry standard shading language is a plus. Have an excellent understanding of technical limitations of game art assets. An ability to work in a team, communicate well and being proactive." End quote. So I suspect that Starbreeze were looking for a generalist technical artist because they mention both the artistic ownership of the assets and extremely competent Python programmer for both Maya and standalone tools. The interesting thing here is that you will be also a creator, at least from what I understand. Not only helping to create stuff, but creating something yourself. Now let's compare it to Bioware job opening in Canada, quote, Bioware is searching for a full-time technical artist to join the Anthem team, end quote. This is an interesting thing here, that I think that to be a technical artist, you have to work, work full-time with the team, or at least most of the week, because it's very important to observe how artists work and to be there to help them in, in anything they, they might have, and any problem. While in other positions, like for example character artist, you may as well work on freelance, just deliver your stuff and communicate from time, time to time with the art lead. And later, quote, 
Technical artists are the bridge between art and programming departments. Candidates should be able to demonstrate efficient techniques for creating high-quality art and explore new paths for future pipelines and content. Requirements Knowledge of 2D and 3D art packages Maya and Photoshop desired, Houdini A+, and experience in scripting and programming, Python and c desired, WPF and Maya API A+, foundational understanding of 3D concepts such as modeling, texturing, rendering, shading, lighting, etc. Familiarity with game engine workflows, asset requirements, performance budgets and profiling, build systems, and asset conditioning, export pipelines. Excellent problem solving and troubleshooting skills. End quote. So this is a lot of requirements, but what I understand from it is that you don't have to be a super pro in every aspect that, that, that is stated here. I think they, they rather want to see that you are willing to learn whatever is in your path. Like, if you are to help artists from department of shading or, or in, in, in lighting and in, in rigging, then you will be, you will be eager to, to learn this stuff to, to accomplish this task. So basically this is again this, this proactive stance that was mentioned in Starbreeze job opening. But familiarity with game engine workflows, performance budget, profiling, and so on, and they show two things for me that the first thing is a technical art job is often more senior level than, than, than typical uh, entries for, uh, from other departments. And the second thing is that the, the profiling thing is very important. We will see it in, in another uh, job opening. So let's move on to Arcane Studios the ones behind Dishonored 2 and Prey, senior technical artist. Quote, Arcane Studios is currently seeking a senior technical artist to help uh, our Austin team deliver high-quality PC and next-generation console games. The technical artist coordinates and upgrades production tools, assists in asset integration and optimization, and serves as a technical reference for art production. Responsibilities. Create best practices documentation for our team on creating great looking optimized game assets, models, textures, shaders, lighting, effects, etc. Research and develop complex game art elements. Help manage runtime performance. Work with art team engineers to develop optimized shaders and lighting as needed. Assist art team members with production tools and upgrades. Collaborate with art and engineering staff on art pipeline and improvements. End quote. Again, as you can see, they mention optimization and helping managing runtime performance, which of course means profiling. There is also this interesting thing of research and development here, that you will not only create assets like uh, or or serve as a help desk, you will also develop the, the new solutions. The, this is the thing I, I mentioned when I was talking about uh, pre-production phase in the game, that you might be very helpful there as a technical artist when you are working in a team that really wants to have custom solutions. And then we have People Can Fly. This is a studio from my uh, city of Warsaw, Poland. People Can Fly was, were responsible for Bulletstorm, Gears of War Judgment along with Epic, and they also did a lot of development on Unreal Engine. So, quote, People Can Fly is looking for a senior, senior technical artist. You should have a combination of strong creative and visual aesthetics and technical knowledge. The job is roughly a 50-50 split in these areas. You should also be experienced in every aspect of the content creation pipeline, as well as to be able to think outside the box to come up with techniques that work better or faster. Responsibilities Material creation Making materials for characters, environment assets, effects, etc. Anything that is overly complex or technical. Level work Often the TA does a pass on a level where fog, lighting, color grading and effects are tweaked and new features are added. Optimization Use diagnostic tools to examine the current content and identify areas for improvement. Tools development. Work with programmers on developing new features, mock-up features in external programs or tweak shader code, 
give feedback to programmers and experiment with features as they add them. Content creation. Sometimes new art assets are required to be tweaked, so modeling and texturing skills are helpful. End quote. So here we have a different situation, more like this Starbreeze stuff, and I suspect this is due to a fact that people can fly have been working with Unreal Engine for the last decade or so. So Unreal Engine already has a lot of great features built in. You don't need to create everything from scratch. This means that technical artists can focus on, on creation as well. But there is a lot of stuff that I talked about covered here. For example, this, this advanced, they say overly complex materials. And optimization again. So the takeaway from all these job openings, if I, I was to suggest something, is to learn profiling optimization, learn about this stuff, pick up some tool like this Intel GPA that I was talking in one of the videos, and also learn Python. I strongly recommend re learning Python, because many tasks when you may feel stuck in can be accomplished really easily with, with some even basic Python scripting. And this will serve as a great base to learning uh, tool development if you're interested in that. Because if you knew some shader creation from Unreal already and, and you played with that, you, you know how to optimize stuff or just were interested in that, and then you know Python, then I think you are on a great way to, to meet the requirements. Thanks so much for staying with me throughout this episode. I'm really curious as to your thoughts, because game development is a huge, varied place, and you definitely have some different perspective, whether you are just starting to look for opportunities, working on an indie project, or or have a lot of experience in, in game dev. So please leave your thoughts in the comments, and see you next time. Cheers!